In a time where the world is confronted with many difficulties, trials and challenges, the Glorious Church must be revived to continue her mandate of possessing the nations with life-transforming truths that nourish the soul, ignite passion and restore hope in the nations. The glory of God is in the church. Jesus, who is accredited with signs and wonders, who perform miracles. When Jesus entered the temple and there was corruption, he turned the tables around. Let's begin turning tables around. It's a huge privilege and a huge responsibility to be an ambassador. If we are the ambassadors of Christ, then we must acknowledge his lordship indeed. Our world has questions, but the answers lie with the church. Our theme for this year, a glorious church revived to possess the nations, seeks to deepen the focus of building a radiant church without spot, wrinkle and blemish whilst sparking a revival that there may be glory in the church. Welcome to Pentecost R, a religious broadcast by the Church of Pentecost. Pentecost R. God's living word to our dying world. Hallelujah. Christ in you. Very grateful to the Almighty God for this opportunity to minister the word of God this morning. I've listened with great interest the messages preached in this conference. The song sang and all the admonitions this week. Because the revival we seek largely depends on you, the young people. It largely depends on you. It has really been awesome as I sat back and listened and to the ministers uh, who have spoken to us this week. I think that we are getting ready to launch out. It makes me confident that God will send us fire. The revival we are praying for, ladies and gentlemen, is not just renewal of Bible study and our prayer lives. No, not at all. We desire something more than that, that God will ignite his fire on our inside and that this fire will go beyond the borders of the church and to the streets and bring deliverance to the dying world. This means that the church will have to be unleashed because this fire will not just travel on its own. You see, the gospel is carried. The gospel is not self-propagating. If you want the fire of God to be found on the streets, then the church must be unleashed. And I'm praying that it will begin from today, that God will send us out, that the fire of the Lord will be ignited in our spirits, that we will send it out to bring deliverance to the dying world and change our generation. I pray that it happens in our time. This morning, I would like to speak on the topic, spiritual living in an increasingly secular world. Spiritual living in an increasingly secular world. Spiritual living in an increasingly secular world. Secularism is a deception. It suggests a no God world. That man is his own God. But behind this is Satan himself. It's Satan himself. Nature does not accommodate that kind of vacuum. A no God world? Not at all. One is always worshipping something or somebody. Let me just say that again. You are always worshipping something or somebody. You are either for God or against God. You are either for our Christ or against our Christ. There is no room for neutrality. There is no room for that kind of vacuum. And no God world, secularism is deception. Sin is basically a departure from God. When we are talking about sin, it's not fornication, lying. Sin is basically a departure from God. Everyone has turned to his own way. That is what the Bible says. And as people go their own way and do their own things, the world makes laws to shield their way of life, which is against God, and cause that human rights. So everything is right because they don't have solution 
to the kind of weakness man has. They tend to make laws to shield those kind of weakness. And so man is departing and departing away from God. We need a savior. We need to cause a revival that will bring people back to God. But how can the creator turn his back on the creator and determine what is right and wrong? Now, how can the one who has been created turn his back on the one who created him and now determine what is right and wrong for him? Where is the maker? Where is the maker's manual? There should be something wrong about secularism. See, recently, just some few days ago, an American congressman, a Democrat, and these are the government that we are going to receive soon, by January 20th. These are the people who are going to rule the world soon. Is Emmanuel Cleaver, a minister by training, he ended a congressional prayer with this statement, Amen. Because he's a black American, said, Amen. And a woman. This is a big man. And he didn't pray this prayer in the closet. He prayed it at the Congress Hall in Washington. When he was ending, now he's a minister by training. Very popular. Maybe the most popular. And then he ended his prayer saying, Amen. And a woman. And the way he described God, he made God nothing. He made God nothing. He, he made God to seem as if it is a thing that depending on your religion and how you define it. But he is a minister by training. When confronted, he justified himself that he was respecting gender balance of the Congress. And he was not remorseful at all. In fact, he claims that people came even to congratulate him. The world is lost. And we need a savior. We just do not need a kind of revival that will happen to us in the church. But it must get to the streets. Otherwise, people like this will deceive many. Now, sit back and let's listen to his prayer. Peace even in this chamber, now and evermore. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. A man and a woman. A man and a woman, uh, the comments that have uh, engendered a sort of a bipartisan rant against probably one of the more beloved congressmen uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm talking about the uh, Missouri Representative Manuel Cleaver, a, a minister by training, uh, who joins us now to explain why he said what he said. Uh, he joins us on the phone. Uh, minister, congressman, uh, a lot of people <laughs> took offense to what you said, that, that you were trying to make a gender politically correct statement when one didn't need to do that. What do you say? I say that, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, a, a society now that uh, participates in orchestrated outrage. 99.999% uh, of the people who are expressing outrage didn't even hear the prayer. The prayer wasn't, wasn't uh, uh, for them. You talk, I'm talking to God on behalf of Congress, asking for unity and so forth, asking God to give us that strength to do that. Uh, then I ended the prayer by saying, amen. We have a record number of women in Congress, including the first chaplain in 240 years uh, of, uh, of the United States history. And, and it, and it goes actually back to the colonial uh, Congress. Um, and, and, and we've just gotten a, a, a first uh, female chaplain in the, in the, in the House. And no, that, all that's well and good. No, you're right. All that's well and good, Congressman. But the amen is actually from a Hebrew word that means so be it. It has nothing to do with gender. So were you just uh, 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 making a point here or were you saying something bigger? Because a lot of people took offense by saying, well, now he's trying to, to sort of uh, gender proof God. No, and that's what I'm saying. People want that we in our society now we look for opportunities to be outraged. Uh, I ended the prayer by saying amen. Which and it is a, it's a Hebrew comes from a Hebrew root word, uh, and there are a lot of definitions of it. But mainly, it's interpreted to be uh, uh, true or 
uh, may it be uh, things like that. The 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 a woman uh, was after the prayer ended, trying to recognize uh, the the record number of women now in Congress. Right. And we- so that is it. If a big man like this start ending his prayer, a man and a woman, and he is not remorseful, a minister, somebody who's supposed to be a minister of God. Young people will take it for joke. Soon, you see people say amen and a woman. You go to school, and then when somebody prays and say amen, somebody in the congregation will get shout a woman. Then, we, we can make laws and protect that. But you see, amen is not just so be it. And this man is saying that uh, his definition of God is something else. It is either uh, somebody or something. Yeah. May God have mercy. Now, but we need to rise and push back these pushbacks. Push back this pushback. The battle is not against anybody. It is against our Christ. You may think they are joking, but it is against our Christ. And we need to stand up and then challenge these ones. Revelation 3, 14. Revelation 3, 14. Uh, it's not just saying that amen is just so be it. Now listen to Revelation 3, 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, this is the words of the amen or the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So, amen, or as people call amen, is not just uh, interpreted as so be it. It is the name of the faithful witness, even Jesus our Lord. And somebody shouldn't just say that it is gender balance because it's amen, so it's a woman. Now, he has talked about this many years, and now he decided to say it at a central place where the ripple effect can go widely and affect the world. May God have mercy. Now, when we are talking about unleashing into the world, we are being granted to be unleashed into such world. It is not just about emotionalism and prayer and charging, but let me tell you the reality. We are being unleashed into such a world. Into such a world. An environment controlled by Satan, sin, and the devil. Sin, the devil, and death which is described in Colossians 1.13 as the kingdom of darkness. The world is a kingdom. It has a ruler, it has a king, and it has a domain. That is the subject under the world, the kingdom, the system, and the territories the ruler surveys. The world has an agenda pushed by all the forces of hell. Express like gangrene, it is aimed at the corruption of the inhabitants of the earth. And that is the nature of its ruler. He came not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So when he's destroying human beings that God has created, he takes delight in that. And that is the world, the ruler of the world. And that is what he seeks to do, to corrupt what God has so beautifully created. The world has its own lifestyle derived from its teachings. Since the fall, it has grown worse and worse. The world has its own lifestyle and it is derived from what it teaches because from the teaching, we also conduct ourselves. And so what we believe, we act. So once the world is making us to believe certain things, it will produce some kind of behaviors. And soon people will say it doesn't matter. And I'm saying that since creation, this is getting worse. And we need Christians who will be able to stop this oppression of the enemy. Genesis 6 verse 5 says this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race has become on earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. King James says, evil continually. So man is not able to think good because in man, sin has entered. And he has con- the devil is controlling his life. 
It is manifested in Romans chapter 1. And I want to take all the trouble to read Romans chapter 1 from verse 18 to 32. Romans 1 from 18 to 32. And I want you to pay close attention to the manifestation of this evil. Romans 1 from verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his internal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish heart was darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up over in the sinful desire of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relationships for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationship with women and were inflamed with lusts for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and receiving themselves the due punishment for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Now look at that. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decrees, that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also, now look at that, approve of those who practice them. Even at the law courts, these things work. That is the world in which we want to unleash you. So it's, it's not a joke. We have to go there and combat with evil. And I want you to put on your full armor. For because we need to turn the tables around, and God must be Lord. The kingdoms of this world must be the kingdom of our God. We know no defeat. Jesus is our captain. And I want you to get prepared as we launch out there into the deep. Ephesians chapter 4, looking at the manifestation of evil on this planet Earth. Some of um, the scriptures that actually paints what is going on. Ephesians 4 from verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in, in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. Now, greed is idolatry. Verse 20. That, however, 
is not the way of life you learn. We are different. But the world is giving itself over to all kinds of evil. You can add Isaiah 59, the whole of that chapter, and when you go home, read and look at the state of the world. It is in this world that Jesus was introduced. Hmm. He was introduced as an agent of transformation. Scripture says, and this is one of my favorite scriptures, John chapter 3, verse 17. John 3, 17. Now, normally we end at 16, and then we don't pay attention to the 17. So, John 3, 16 is very popular. So, once we get to 16, for God so loved the world. But I think this one is a big one, too. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The King James says that the world might be saved through him. So, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It is for this same purpose that we are being granted to be unleashed into the world, that this dead world, that this evil world will be saved through us. Now remember, when you are in school, you are introduced there as an agent of transformation. You are there not to condemn sinners because the sinner cannot save him or herself. So condemning the sinner is cost 90. You have done nothing. So what you need to do is that you avail yourself that the world, the sinner through you will be saved. Hallelujah. So we are going out there as agents that people through us will find our Savior Jesus Christ. As Jesus was prepared and anointed for the tax, so are we prepared and anointed for the tax. You see, what we are doing this week is to let you know who you are. Otherwise, you are prepared and anointed for the tax already. We are only telling you the kind of person you are so that you go out there knowing that God is with you. You go out there with all the confidence that you can. God is already with us. Now, living for Christ in a perverse world. I'll spend some time talking about how we can live for Christ in this perverse world. Because whether you like it or not, we have unleashed you. So I'm imagining that you are in the world now, trying to be an agent of transformation. How do you live for Christ in a perverse, this crooked world of wickedness? See, many who go into the world, into schools, workplaces, etc., with a desire to live for Christ, soon find a mirage of challenges to their commitment. And they struggle to know how to come out victoriously. Many people just make some pledges and resolutions that you see after this unleashing conference. Now when I go, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that. Now when he lands in school, just give him a week or two. Then the challenges confront him. Either he buckles or he backs up and makes so many kinds of excuses. But I pray that it doesn't happen to us this time. In the name of Jesus. See, the world threatens to excuse us into its mode. Because see, when you go on there, the world is not just there for naught. Jesus said the prince of this world comes. That is why he said that, you see, the, between the kingdom of God is suffering violence. And if you take the violence, you take it by force. In fact, if I were the devil, I would not sit down for the kingdom of God to come and overthrow my kingdom. So he fights back. So when you get to school, it is a battle. Don't give up because of the challenges. You need to just strengthen yourself and battle. Let us avail ourselves that through us, many will come to the saving knowledge of Christ. So that we are not skews into the world's mode. See, many years ago, a bishop of Uganda said this about his people. The Baganda. The Baganda. The Baganda is the largest ethnic group in Uganda. And this is what the bishop said. If you can project it, I want us to read together. If you can project it. Now, if you are ready, let's go. If it came to eight, I think the Baganda would be ready to die for Christ today. It is living for him that they find difficult. Yeah. People want to die for political leaders. So I'm sure 
Somebody who wants to die for Christ. But we are not called for, for us to die for him. He has died for us. We don't need that. But we need to live. We are living sacrifices. We are not dead sacrifices. He says that if it came to dying for Christ, he's sure that the Baganda people will die for him. He's sure that the Ghanaians will die for him. People will go to church, and if you look at the, how ojashos their faces, when you start prayer, about 10 young men will come and stand in front of every mic and hold their ears and begin to scream, begin to scream. <laughs> My boy told me that when he went to the university, he didn't know how to pray this kind of prayer. And then you see that somehow some people will just eh, hold their waist like that. Then begin to shout. <clears throat> say, hey, these people. Then he also decided that he would try. And when they say, oh, you say, say, oh. When you look at them praying like this, you think that they will even die for Christ. But when it comes to living for him, that is a challenge. We are not dying now. So we must prepare our minds to live for him. So that the world through us might be saved. That the world through us might be saved. How do we survive in this crooked and perverse world? How do we overcome and save people from the kingdom of the devil? I will offer some few tips as I have received from the Lord. Humbly. Particularly from the book of Daniel and from that man in particular. Number one. We need to have a clear-cut resolution. Know who you are and declare who you are. We need to have a clear-cut resolution. Now, as you go back to school, have a clear-cut resolution. Maybe you are to your workplace, have a clear-cut resolution this year. Know who you are and declare who you are. Why am I saying this? Daniel 1 verse 8. Daniel 1 verse 8. Very popular verse. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief officials for permission not to defile himself this way. You see, I think we all know this. Or if you don't know, it's one of the popular verses in Daniel. See, right at the start of his training, he made a firm decision. The people knew what he stood for. Right at the beginning of the training. You see, this, this declaration was made right at the beginning. Once they brought their food, they said, we will not eat. Right at the beginning. So the people knew the principles on which he stood on. Sometimes we hide our Christianity. And that becomes a problem to us. Declare who you are. Declare who you are. Let your friends know that this is who you are. See, when I was growing up humbly, I would always declare who I was. And up to today, I would declare who I am. And beyond that, I tried in my mind to be the pastor among the pastors, to be the Christian among the Christians. Tried, set myself higher standards, higher standards that I would pastor the pastors when pastors meet. And when we were boys, I tried to be the best Christian among them. <laughs> I remember when I was in Thomas Secondary School. They used to call me Sir Holiness. <laughs> I've just remembered Sir Holiness. You see, because I set myself higher standards. And for them to give you, uh, this one is not from the Queen of England. This one is from my own colleagues. And I thank God for that. Set yourself higher standards. Right at the beginning, let people know who you are. And stick to it. Know what you stand for. Right at the start of his training, he made a firm decision. The people knew what he stood for. Now, Daniel 6 verse 5. Daniel 6 verse 5. Finally, this man said, We will never find any basis for charges against this Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. You know, he set the standards and now he's old and they want charges against him. They want some fault. They say, ask for this man unless, because they know his stance. Set, let people know your stand. Now, if you have been going out with this young man who is not your husband, as you go back, 
let him know your stand. Don't be going to him as if you are going to visit him. It doesn't matter. You see, doesn't, it matters. Let them know your stand. Don't let people be fumbling with you and say, oh, stop, stop. Let them know your stand. Let your lecturers know your stand. Let them know who you are. Taking a firm step at the start helps us keep our commitment as time goes on. When people get to know we are Christians and that we have certain principles, they expect us to act differently. And sometimes when they are joking and you also come in or you do certain things, ah, but you said you were a Christian. So now the people even expect you to act differently. Let them know your stand. Let us listen to Jesus. One of the most powerful verses in scripture, and I like it, John chapter 9, verse 5. John 9, 5. This is the master himself. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I like the King James, as long as I'm in the world. You see, he's saying that as long as I'm in the world simply means that there's going to come a time that I will not be in this world. But as long as I'm around, I am the light of the world. Declare who you are. Declare who you are. And that one is able to shield you. Declare who you are. Then in John 8, 12, Jesus said, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As Jesus' reps here on earth, we are the light of the earth and we must declare it. Jesus told the disciples, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. A town built, build your, your town on a hill and don't hide it. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Don't hide your light. Lift it and put it on a stand. Let everybody know who you stand for. And draw your lines. Draw your lines. Number two. Be wise as serpents. And harmless as the dove. In dealing with the world. In dealing with the world. Be wise as serpent. And harmless as the dove. You see because the world is a dangerous place. They are wicked people and they are wicked men. The world is full of trappings. The devil is a schema. If Jacob was a supplanter, then don't try Satan and the devil. See, he is a supplanter. He's a schema. And sometimes he uses many tricks to take away Jesus from us. So be careful and then be very wise in the way you deal with the world. Matthew 10 verse 16. I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. So when we are saying we are unleashing you into the world, we are unleashing you as sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as thou. Now the snake, this serpent is shrewd. It is very subtle. It is only the snake that can leave you few in your room for the rest of your life, but you will never meet it. Snake can leave you few comfortably in your room. And you, you, you make sure that you don't see it. He says that be shrewd like that. And then innocent as a dove. So now the dove does not commit anything that will bring him trouble. Once you blink your eyes, the dove is gone. So try not to be somebody who is suffering because of your own evil. Try not to bring problems on yourself. Walk this way. You see, the Bible says that the road that leads to heaven is a narrow way. But some of you, you walk carelessly, you throw your hands about. That is not how Christians walk on the planet Earth. They walk this way. Because that road that leads to heaven is narrow. So how do you throw your hands about? Be careful and be wise when we are dealing with the world. Daniel made a firm resolution not to eat the king's food or drink his wine. But this so with a polite and respectful request. He should be a wise person to have served for, for over 67 years in the palace under four powerful kings as a foreigner. He should be a very wise person. And you see from the way he speaks, this is the queen of Persia's testimony about Daniel. 
as recorded in Daniel 5 from verse 11. Daniel 5, 11. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. <laughs> like this is the woman's testimony about the foreigner who has lived around all this. By this time, he's age. He was grown over 70 years or 80 plus. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, I pointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and div diviners. He said, this man is full of intelligence and wisdom. Over the years, this is the queen's testimony concerning that man. We need to be wise. In dealing with the world, we need to be extremely careful in how we handle our life. How we handle our life. If you are a lady, be careful the times you visit young people. It can cost you. Handle your life. Our time. Handle our time. The places we trek. Now, this leg is for you. Advise the leg to go to certain places and not to go to certain places. Don't let your leg carry you. Take control of your life. Your own body. Please. 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 The company we keep, we have to be wise. So far as the company we keep is concerned. The literature we read. The music we listen to. The time we move out and come in. We need to be wise. Number three. Point number three. We need to remember we are the test of the gospel. See, we are the test of the gospel. And that in saving the world, the world sometimes will take all the trouble to test you. And then get some evidence before they come and join your God. Why am I saying this? See, Daniel must have realized that the officials would not authorize his request for a different diet. Daniel realized that. Unless they were sure they would not get in trouble by doing so. I, I, do you agree with me? So because when he said, this, the man said, ah, my head is on the line. Do you want Nebuchadnezzar to chop off my head? Then Daniel says something. So he presented a reasonable proposal that they could accept. This is what he said. Please, test your servant for 10 days. 10 days, but not many more. 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. 10 days. And then treat us in accordance with what you see. Test us. It was a plea for 10 days test. A humble plea. As the words, please and servants suggest. The people of the world do not know much about God. They need evidence that he is indeed who he claims to be. They need evidence. Many don't think it is worth following Christ. They will look to those who represent him on earth for evidence of the relevance and the desirability of the Christian way. They will look to you for evidence and the desirability of the Christian way. We are the tests of the gospel in the world. So pass the test. Don't fail God. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let them see it, pass the test, so that they can glorify God who is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. Paul says that you yourself are letters written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. So people are reading. As you pass by, they are reading. As you answer questions, lecturers are listening and they are reading. <laughs> When I was in a certain school, I, I surprised one lecturer. Because the man, the man trusted me. And then there was this issue. Um, 
<laughs> and then the people who were involved were all running away. And, but I knew, I knew what really happened. So when we heard that the man was coming, they all ran away. So we went into a certain room. Then when the man came and he saw this boy, he said, you good people. But he was surprised to have seen me. <laughs> so when he saw me, he was so disappointed. So Eric, oh, oh, <laughs> I still remember. God, this boy, so you too. <laughs> but the man left, because of me, he left the case. He just walked away. <laughs> The day I heard that he was dead, I was, I was sorry. I was sorry. Because I, I, I didn't, couldn't have any opportunity to, to, to explain this to them because he would not listen. The next time he saw me in class, he looked at me and he bowed down his head. He was a drunkard. He bowed down his head. <laughs> Probably I should have passed that test. I should have passed we are the letters people read. People read. We are God's letters. People, you are Church of Pentecost letters. And the big one is in John 17, 22 and 23. Please, when you go home, read. He says that by your life, you even prove that God really sent Jesus. So sometimes by our cursed life, people think that Jesus did not come on this planet. Point number four. Don't conform to the pattern of the world. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Don't conform to the pattern of the world. Daniel distinguished himself. A clear difference. Noticeable and readable. See, Daniel distinguished himself. Made a clear difference between him and them. And it was noticeable. It was readable. Very clear. Daniel 6 Verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satra to rule throughout the kingdom. With their administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators that the satraps, by his exceptional qualities, that the king plan to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. This is a man born of a woman. He was not an angel. So if he did it, we can also do it. He led a distinguished life. It was not somebody who conformed the patterns of this world. Patterns of this world. Number five. The fifth point is that you must live modestly. Live modestly. You see, our quest for this prosperity gospel, and I want to be rich. I want to have a white color job. I want to do this by armies. According to 1 Timothy 6, 5, there down, Many people have made shipwreck of their faith because of the desire for money, desire for wealth. 1 Timothy 6, 5 to 9. They have made shipwreck of their faith. Demas has loved this world. See, so sometimes we don't want to live modestly. We want things that we cannot get. So we strive at all costs. And sometimes we do that at the expense of our Christian work. But let's listen to Daniel. Daniel chapter 5, verse 16. Daniel 5, 16. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck. This one, Haman will love it. Yeah, Haman. And you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now listen to Daniel. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your reward to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. You keep your gift, but I'll read the writing. I'm not here for money. I'm not here for money. 
the sixth point. Take up your cross and follow him. Life is full of challenges. We all have our crosses, but we need to take it and follow Christ. Just as he carried his cross, you need to carry your cross. We all have our own crosses or suffering we carry. That is the way our master led. And as servants, we cannot do otherwise than to carry our cross. In fact, in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, the scripture says, 2 Timothy 3 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. See, once you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus in this world, it means that you'll be going against the current. And that one is tough. If we are bathing in the water, swimming, and you are going against the current, it is tougher than the current driving you. So it is tough. And then if you want to live a godly life as a young person in the world, you will suffer persecution. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learn them. As for you, as for you, there will be persecution, but stand and continue in what you have learned. See, in chapter 6 of Daniel, he was cast into a lion's den by evil persecutors. He had not done anything to them, but he found himself in the lion's den, you see. But, see, he was a righteous man. And righteousness is a breastplate. And then with the breastplate that he has won, lions, they don't chew plates. Because you have to break the place before you get to the flesh. But here was the man wearing his righteousness. They can't chew that one. You may suffer persecution, but at the end of the day, you cannot be destroyed. You cannot be destroyed. Hmm. Jesus said, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because of their evil deeds. So because people like darkness more than light, when you are bringing the light, normally those who are in the darkness, they are naked. The darkness covers their nakedness. So when you bring the light, you are kind of exposing them. So they will oppose you. But let me tell you something. Keep on with your light. Point it at them. They will find something to wear. Now listen. When you bring the light, they will shout at you and insult you because they are naked. But please keep the light on. They will find something to wear. They will find something to wear. Truth is nowhere to be found according to Isaiah 59 verse 15. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. When you shun evil, people will persecute you. Now, the last point here is consistently stay the course. In the world, as a good Christian, consistently stay the course. Don't let persecution frighten you. Consistently stay the course. Psalm 37, verse 4 and 5. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. And I want you to pay attention to what he's going to do. Just consistently trust in him and delight in him. Delight in him. Don't be worried. Don't be flattened. Because of the prosperity of the wicked. Don't do that, but trust in him. He will do this, verse 6. Verses, if you can read together, if you can project verses. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Your vindication like the new day sun. Certainly God will show up and then lift you up. God will bring you reward, but you have to stay on course. Stay on course. See, Daniel was consistent with his worship of Yahweh God. For many times, under several kings, they praise his God, the God of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar seems to have believed in the God of Israel because of Daniel's consistent spiritual life. Now, listen to Nebu here. Daniel 2, 47. The king said to Daniel, Surely, 
Your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Now, chapter 4, from verse 34. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures for generations to generations. You sometimes, when we are doing worship, let's leave Psalms and come to this one from the book of Nisa. The book of Nisa is saying wonderful things, all because of the consistent spiritual life of Daniel. Consistent spiritual life. Our time will not permit me to talk about how Darius praised God. Daniel 6, 25 to 28. But where was his strength? He was a public figure. How could he do all this in the midst of the Nebuchadnezzar and the threats? His strength was in his spirituality. See, 1,095 days, he never ate any good food. It was only vegetables and water. 1,095 days because they requested for three years of just feeding on vegetables and water. Now he, 1,095 days, he was living on water and vegetables for the sake of the glory of his God. What a challenge. So God was building him in the closet. His fasting and prayer life was something else. 21 days many times. Daniel, Daniel chapter 9 verse 3. Chapter 10 verse 3. Chapter 6 verse 10. So chapter 6 verse 10. Chapter 9 verse 3. Chapter 10 verse 3. This is study of the scripture. The Bible says that I understood by the books. So he was a man of the books. Yeah. Daniel 9 verse 2. He was a man of the books. A man of spiritual gift and wisdom. He was, he was versatile in spiritual gifts and wisdom. Now when he was starting, the book, he told Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar said, I've had a dream, and then I want you to tell me what is in my mind. And Daniel said, okay, give me time. Let me go and co consult my, my, my friends who will pray and bring you the answer. Then later on, when you just told him the dream, he would just stand there and interpret. Now he, he was growing now in the giftings. You tell him, he will interpret. In the beginning, he said, I will go and consult. That was a man of great spirituality. Full of wisdom. Now, God accredited his ministry with signs and wonders. If they put you in the lion's den and you come up alive, there is no miracle like this one. So, let me just make this last statement. I want you to repeat after me. The man of God is made in the closet. His powerful public life it's a reflection of his private life with God. Be grounded in the closet and be unleashed in the marketplace. May the Lord be with us. Now, we don't want to end this message without giving you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus. If you will, I want you to lift up your hands wherever you are. That today you want to come and join us. You want to come and join the Jesus' party so that we are unleashed to bring glory to God in the marketplace. If you want to give your life to Jesus, just repeat this after me. Dear Lord, acknowledge that I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sins and be my Lord and personal Savior. If you have prayed this simple prayer, then I want you to know that you are born again. God bless you. And now if you are here, I want every one of us to stand up if you can. We want to commit ourselves to the Lord. That God will strengthen us the more. That we will be able to live that kind of spiritual life in this perverse world. The tips that God has given us. We pray that God will let it sink into our spirit. 
that we will be able to live such kind of life that will bring glory to him. That just as Christ was introduced into the world, that the world must be saved. Let us avail ourselves that through us, the dying world will be saved. Shall we pray together wherever you are? In the name of Jesus. Wale basanda. Beri atoka yende. Shadaba, shadaba, shadaba.